<clears throat> Welcome to the Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz, and joining us today is Robert Trzinski. He is a senior fellow at the Atlas Society, a columnist at Discourse Magazine, and the author of Who is John Galt Anyway? A Pocket Guide to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Welcome, Robert. Uh, thanks for having me on. I just read an article that you wrote six years ago, and it was about how not to argue on Facebook. And it resonated with me because I just had a debate with somebody on Facebook the other day about tariffs and Donald Trump. And the question I asked was, is Donald Trump pro-capitalist? And the person said, oh, yes, he is. So we got into an argument about tariffs. And the person ultimately responded to me by saying, Donald Trump's a lot smarter than you are. And he's for these policies. So there. And I, I said, well, I responded part tongue in cheek. And I said, well, the fact that you think he's smarter than me doesn't prove your point. But I said, let me one up you. And I said, Milton Friedman, Ludwig von Mises and Adam Smith would all disagree with Donald Trump. And they're all smarter than he is. And of course, it was a ridiculous argument that I made. But I didn't you know how else do you respond to that stuff? So I thought that I would like to talk to you not just about arguments on Facebook, but arguments in general. So what is an argument and why are arguments important? Well, OK, so an argument is a logically connected series of basically starting with evidence, citing evidence and showing its logical connection to a conclusion. Right. So an argument isn't just shouting. You know, there's the old uh, Monty Python argument clinic sketch, right, where the uh, um uh, the guy goes into an argument clinic to have a ten minutes, a ten minute argument with someone, and the, it ends up. Uh, John Cleese ends up saying, "You know, just contradicting him everything." No, it isn't. Says, That's not contradiction. An argument is a logically connected series of 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 claims that you back up with evidence. And he says, "No, it isn't," and it's all just contradiction. And oftentimes, I feel like we're art, we're we're playing out that that argument clinic sketch, that yeah, that old Monty Python sketch, uh, daily on social media. Now, the funny thing is, this article you found. Uh, was about arguing on Facebook. It's a bit of a time capsule there because I never argue on Facebook anymore. All the the all my arguing I do on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know the, the locations for these things change. But the idea is that uh, the reason why an argument is important is that it's important to be correct. It's important to get things right, to to have the correct response to the events that are happening in the world. And so to do that, we need to be looking at the evidence. You need to be looking at the world. You need to be observing the evidence and then making sure that the evidence fits together, that it makes logical sense uh, to keep yourself from going off the rails. And and people, you know, there, there are all these incredible hysterias that people have uh, and moral panics and things like that. They, they come from not looking carefully at the evidence and not logically putting it together. And you can go marching off a cliff when you, when you follow that. And unfortunately, I think we're we're not uh, we're not behaving well uh, on in our online spaces. I mean, you know, it, it's always a challenge to get people to to argue rationally and logically about things. But especially in our online uh, spaces right now in social media, I think a lot of the incentives are very much towards. Um, various kinds of illogical kinds of argument and appeals to emotion. And uh, yeah, there's a fascinating thing. I just wrote about this recently that that's been coming up that a number of people, uh, Greg Lukianoff and, and John Haidt are, have been doing this for a number of years now talking about how, um, you know, in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is this new kind of psychotherapy that, that seems to actually be fairly effective. They talk about basically identifying wrong thinking methods that people have that cause them to to sort of spin around in their own heads and and talk themselves into various psychological problems like cognitive distortions right yeah cognitive distortions is the term they use and you know it's like catastrophizing like everything is the end of the world and if you know uh taking sort of ambiguous events that that could have a positive or negative spin and always spinning them as oh this is the end of the world this is a catastrophe every the sky is falling and this is one of the things that, you know, when you if you go in for treatment for depression, for example, they, they teach you to identify when you're catastrophizing and then to to stop doing it. Right. And of course, this is the sort of thing that gets the clicks. It gets the engagement online. So uh, they have this theory of sort of I think the term is reverse cognitive behavioral therapy that we're all 
doing all the things that the cognitive behavior you know, that the therapists tell us not to do, that we're all doing it and we're actually doing it in an extreme way because those are the incentives of a lot of our social media and online spaces where that's what gets the clicks, that's what gets the engagement. Um, and that's what gives people positive attention is engaging in these these cognitive distortions and bad thinking methods that that take us off the rails. And so I think you know, it's, like I said, it's always been a challenge to get people to to think, especially when you get to politics and things that are very emotionally charged, to get them to sit back and carefully look at the evidence and think very rationally about it. Uh, but I think it's, you know the the social media environment has become particularly um, uh, unsuited to that. <laughs> Or hostile to it. It seems to me that there's two uniquely human attributes that allow us to engage in argumentation. It's the faculty of reason, the ability to think logically, and also language. So it seems to me that when I engage somebody in an argument, I'm showing that person the utmost respect and acknowledgement of that person as a human being with the capacity to engage in such an argument. Now, I might be wrong in the argument, and if so, an argument's good because it'll show me that I'm wrong and that I can correct myself or likewise for the you know my interlocutor. But it seems like when when I uh, with a lot of people, when they argue, it's just an emotional sort of this is what I believe, therefore it's right, you're wrong. And then it goes beyond that even too. If you disagree with me, you're a jerk. It's you couldn't just be somebody smart that happens to disagree with me and might be wrong, but you're a, a real scumbag because you have a different point of view. Have you seen that in the society or on Facebook, Twitter, wherever? Oh, oh absolutely, it, it, it's everywhere. Well, well, you mentioned that you know we we argue because we have the capacity for rationality, for reason, to be able to use our minds to understand what's going on in the world. Well. Along with that comes the capacity for its misuse. And uh, along with the capacity for rationality comes the capacity for rationalization. Yeah. And rationalization is the idea that you start with something that you, you know, what's the old saying? You can't reason somebody out of something he was never reasoned into in the first place. So you start with something that you weren't reasoned into, something that was a pre existing commitment, either because it's, it's part of, either because it's, it suits your emotional state or, you just accidentally pick this up as a, a hobby horse of yours or because it's part of, I think very frequently, it's part of sort of your identity, your tribal identity. You 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 see yourself as being in the group of the good and right and decent people and good and right and decent people believe X. And so therefore you have to defend X and whatever, whether that's religious or whether it's woke or whether it's some other uh, you know political idea, more narrowly political idea. And so people then, and I think, by the way, that's that's, you know, they say politics is the worst team sport. And and that's sort of, I think, a, a major driver of it is this idea of a, of getting a personal having having your personal identity and almost your self-esteem tied up in. I am a person who defends idea, not, you know, this particular idea. And that, I think, is what drives a lot of the emotion of it. A lot of the you are a terrible person kind of approaches is, is the other person can't just can't just be wrong he has to be he's the out he said he has to be a member of the out group he has to remember those evil people over there against whom we the good people define our personal identity um but, but like i said you know with the capacity for reason comes the capacity for rationalization and rationalization is you start with an idea that you got through some other means other than reason uh through tribal entity or or, or fits your emotional state and then you come up with reasons after the fact for why this idea is correct. And, and oftentimes it means explaining away various uh, counter arguments or, or evidence that, that doesn't fit it. And therefore, you know, protecting you have you, you, you're you're arguing to protect this idea and not in order to get to the truth. I'm glad you mentioned the, the rationalization because in Aristotelian logic or Aristotelian logic, you had A is A, the law of identity, the law of excluded middle, and the law of non-contradiction. But there's also logical fallacies. Can you tell us a little bit about logical fallacies and the role they play in these, for lack of a better word, debates that, that are taking place? <laughs> well, okay. So the um, uh, a logical fallacy is really, it's the, it's the earliest version of this idea. We talked about a cognitive distortion. And the specific thing about a fallacy is not that it's wrong, 
I mean, but part of it is that it's a it's a method of or, or a, a style of arguing or reasoning that is wrong, but it's one. What makes it a fallacy is that it is superficially plausible that it can fool you into thinking that you are engaging in in thinking when you're actually going off the rails. So it 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 sort of has some sort of superficial plausibility or appeal to it, and it, it might fool someone. But by identifying this, we can see how it's actually incorrect. And and we talked a little bit about this, um, that, uh, you know, we have the one of the big arguments, you know, it talked about this idea of, of why people get so emotionally angry, because, you know, I'm a member of the group of good people, and you're a member of the group of bad people. And if I could sort the world into your I'm we're the good people, and you're the bad people, then that helps me support my argument. And so one of these is, you know, what's called the the ad hominem argument to the uh ad hominem just you know most of these have latin and greek names uh because they were that those are the people of an aristotle and the people following him were the ones who identified all this um I mean, there are modern ones that i i quite like um but the original ones were are, are all have greek and latin names and ad hominem just means an argument to the man it's the argumentum ad hominem you're appealing to who the person is it's basically how can you believe what this person says given what an awful person he is Right. And and so the fact is that, you know, instead of addressing the argument, instead of addressing the evidence, instead of addressing the logic, you are trying to cast aspersions on the person and make them out to be the bad guy. And therefore, you know, how could you believe something said by such a rotten person? Uh, and uh, this this happens a lot in our online spaces. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really funny is that the people making fun of, you know, they'll, they'll like look at your profile picture and try to make fun of how you look in your profile picture like, you know, that you know, that, uh, that like that has any bearing on anything, but also half 99% of the time when somebody does this, they don't have a picture in their profiles. Like, you know, they, they don't have the guts, to, <laughs> they don't have the guts to let the world know how they look, uh, but they're going to make fun of how you look. So, you know, which makes me assume that, that, that how they look must not be very impressive. Um, but, uh, uh, the, it's it's the one of my other favorite ones that's come up recently. So I said a lot of these were identified in, you know, by the they have Latin and Greek names because they were identified by Aristotle and people who came after him. But there's one that's fairly recent in the last 10 or 15 years and it's called the Mott and Bailey argument. Now, it's kind of hard. You, you can look this up, Mott, M-O-T-T-E and Bailey. But it, it's actually a reference to medieval defensive architecture, that there was this approach you took in, in, in the Middle Ages. If you had to wanted to defend a position is you had a Mott and you had a Bailey. The Mott is, a, is like a tower or a castle. It's a very it's a strong point up on a hill, very, very, very small area, but very easy to defend. Whereas the Bailey was the thing you actually wanted to protect. It was a very large area. It might be like a field of sheep or a field of crops or whatever. It's a large area, but it's so big you can't defend it easily. You can maybe put a little ditch or a little fence around it. And so the idea is that when you were attacked, you would evacuate the the Bailey and you retreat into the Mott. You know, you you take the the large area that's really valuable that you want to defend. You would not try to defend it because it's hard to defend, you go back into the small area that's highly defensible. Uh, and then the idea is having defeated then, you know, having uh, waited out your attackers, uh, having fended them off, once they leave, you would go back and you'd reclaim the Bailey because that's the part you really want. Well, people do this in argument. And what they do is they'll make an expansive claim, you know, something very, very broad uh, about, uh, you know, some very broad claim like, Everything, you know, the United States is a, is a country based on racism at its very beginning. This is the 1619 Project claim, right? Yeah. America is a country founded on racism. Very broad claim, takes in a lot of territory. It's a lot of territory you want to hold, intellectually speaking. Then when somebody attacks you and says, well, wait a minute, what about this and what about that? And they start coming up with counter arguments and counter examples and, and taking apart some of your claims. What do you do? You scurry back to the mot. <laughs> and, you know, the mot is... You know, racism existed. Uh, uh, slavery ex has existed, and segregation existed in the United States, right? So that's a different claim. It's a narrow, much narrower claim than the claim that the United States was founded on racism. That, that's the whole essence of our of the of the American system. Very different claim, a much much narrower claim. But because of that, it's it's totally indefensible. Uh, sorry, it's totally um, unassailable. Uh, you know, it's it's extremely defensible. Who can deny that slavery existed in the United States? Who can deny that segregation existed? So then, of course, having then gone back to your mot and defended that, 
you wait till the people, the attackers go away, and then you go back and you you reclaim the Bailey and you go back to making that claim. That is a, a pattern you will see an awful lot online that somebody has this expansive claim they want to make. When attacked, they re retreat to a narrow and defensible one and then go back and reclaim it after it's after it's all over as if as if they've won the argument. I like that one a lot. And, you yeah. know, the ad hominem you talked about, it reminds me a lot of when for years now I've been arguing uh, for Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism mm -hmm. and almost to a person, the, the people I debate with will attack her personally. And my response always is, look, I don't care what kind of human being she was. I didn't know her. I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe she was a saint. Maybe she was a sinner. I have really no way to know. What I do know is that she put forth a systematic philosophy that I've yet to see anybody fundamentally refute. Now, there's, you know, phrases that she used that I disagree with myself. But the fundamentals in metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, I've never seen anybody refute. But people seem to think that if they insult her, they've done the job you know the, the the compulsion here is that the the best way to win an argument is never to have it in the first place right <laughs> and that is you know the, the the best way to win an argument for in a lot of people's minds the best way to win an argument is to rule your opponent uh it, 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 him invalid from from the beginning you know to basically to to undermine him to undercut him to discredit him before the argument even begins and therefore you win by default right? the other person's arguments aren't even uh, admitted into into the uh, into the discussion, and you know that's that's the temptation people have. I think though it is a self defeating one though because when you don't answer the argument, you actually have not made your position stronger. You have not supported your position. This is an old arg argument. I, it's really um, I disagree with John Stuart Mill on some things, but he was very eloquent in, in his essay on liberty. He made I think one of the most eloquent cases for this, and one of the things he said is. He who understands only his own side of an argument understands little of that, that the purpose of arguing with people is not just I'm going to convince this person. It's also that in arguing about your own position in in taking on opposition and considering counter arguments, you are actually learning more about, you know, assuming your position is true, you're going to, you know, I, the, what Will says is, you know, if your position is not true, you have learned something very valuable. But even assuming your position is true and you're defending the right view, you're going to learn a lot more about your own position by considering all the evidence, all the counter arguments and saying, well, let's see this fact over here that seems to undermine position, my position. How does that really fit in? And you will discover new facts and, and, and new support. And I think when you, when you bluster and intimidate and try to shout people down, you are actually undermining your own position because you are passing up an opportunity to establish in the audience's minds the actual facts and arguments that support your position, right? So by trying to win the argument without having it, you're actually losing it because you are you are missing that opportunity to bring to other people. Now, maybe you're not going to convince your opponent in an argument, but you could convince the audience, the other people who are are watching the discussion. You could put it into their minds the 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 facts that are back your position, the the logical connections, the arguments, new ideas that would be valuable to them. You could introduce all of that, and by by ruling somebody out of out of the discussion on an ad hominem from the very beginning, you are you know undercutting yourself by doing that. Um, but like I said, you know the the I think social media. The reason why social media has had been a problem is the term they use is gamification, right? That you turn everything into a game, and I I see that definitely that there's sort of a gamification of arguing, right? That it becomes about scoring points against the other person for the sake of, you know, in the eyes of your audience. And you often see online, and I think the corrosive thing about what happens online is that, you know, it's something you have to consider about it. As, a, as a professional, somebody who who, who writes and, and uh, talks for a living, I'm occasionally, you know, it, it's a, it's an occasional thing that I will go up and I'll have to do a debate or a discussion with somebody where we're going back and forth. And, you know, it, it's, 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 it's pitted as a thing where I'm, each one of us is up there to make the case for our side. And we're really both not, we're not trying to convince each other because, you know, we know we're all both committed to one side of our arguments or the other. So we're not trying to convince each other. We're both talking really to the audience. 
that doesn't normally happen in one-on-one conversation that you would have with a friend or, or a coworker or, or a neighbor where you, there is no audience. You're just talking to the other person. And the only goal you have is how can I get this other person to, to, you know, how can I give him something that will be compelling and interesting and uh, will break through his defenses and um, be interesting enough and compelling enough and, and well-reasoned enough that he will want to consider it. So you, you argue in a totally different way if you're actually trying to convince your opponent rather than talking to the audience, you know, performing for the, for the yeah. sake of the audience. Well, I think what social media does is it takes a lot of that. It brings that performing for the audience attitude. It does that for the average person. Right, that you are always a whenever you go online, whenever you go on Facebook, or especially when you ever go on Twitter, you are a debater. You're a champion. You're not. You're not just talking to a, a friend or neighbor. You are a champion for your cause, and you have to score points for your cause. And you're and you always have the eye on the audience and not on the person you're talking to. And like I said, you know, for professionals who do this, you know, this is just part of the nature of the way you do public debate, but. You have to keep in mind the the difference between arguing with a you know a, a committed a committed partisan, arguing with them for the sake of of appealing to the audience versus arguing with someone for the sake of actually convincing them, which is ninety percent of of how of how ideas actually get actually get spread and adopted. You know what we're talking about. It seems to me ultimately is rationality versus irrationality, and it seems like that has spread so far into our culture and there's two f- phenomenons or two phenomena right now that i think exemplify irrationality and emotionalism more than the other and that is wokeism on the left and trump populism on the right and many people i think would think these two things are polar opposites but in my view all the, they're both just emotional tribalism it's just different tribes how do you think that this the whole framework that we've been discussing of reason versus unreason how do you think it fits into and has influenced these two supposed dichotomies which really are very similar yeah i do, i do think you're you're right on that that there has been sort of a a mirror image i mean this is something that the unfortunately i think conservatives have done a lot over the decades is that oftentimes they will echo back to, you know the, the the left will do something they'll say oh that's really terrible and then if, at, at a delay of 10 to 15 years they'll echo that thing back in, but with their own version of it um and i think that's definitely what they're doing because it's you know so much of trumpism and trumpist populism specifically uh is influenced by this idea of how dare you disrespect my group that is you know that it's the identity of oh well you know the problem with the left is they look down on ordinary people in the heartland like you and me and so therefore you know we have to adopt this to get back at them you know we have to we have to uh, uh attack everything they do and attack everything they say because it's about our it's about our group identity that's under attack and this sense of victimhood and all of this is stuff that you know was basically the left adopted en masse you know 15 20 30 years ago and especially that emphasis on on victimhood and the idea that, you know, we're victims and therefore uh, other, you know, the, the worst thing that's ever happened is somebody else did, uh, looked down on us and showed disrespect to us. And that made us victims. And therefore, we are entitled to believe whatever we want to believe and say whatever we want to say because we're victims it's that appealed to victimhood. Um, I'm actually working on a piece. So I know you're you're a fan of Ayn Rand. I I I have a piece that's actually sort of based on an article she did that I I happened to reread a, a, a year or so ago, and I was struck by how prescient it was in ways that she could never have predicted. Now this is an article she wrote I think in 1773. It's called 1973, right? 1973. Yeah, so not like, 1773. No, but 50 years ago. So she's writing this 50 years ago. It, it was about a series of – it's called Censorship Local and Express, and it was about a series of Supreme Court rulings uh, that – now here's sort of the irony. It's a series of Supreme Court rulings that were passed to basically allow bans on pornography. Now, the interesting thing about this is that banning pornography didn't actually really happen as a result of these Supreme Court rulings, even though that was the the upshot of it. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. I think partly technological reasons, because at the time it was basically about could a local, could a local town ban a, a pornographic movie theater from opening in the towns in the middle of the town? 
And well, you know, technology leapfrogged over that. That no, no longer an issue. We all, you know, everything's on the internet now. Uh, it's all on a server in Cyprus somewhere. So, you know, it's, it's outside of the laws of the United States even. Uh, so technologically, that never came to pass. But what I found fascinating was the argument. Because they basically said, the Supreme Court basically said, you can ban something if it is offensive by local community standards. And there's two elements of that. One is that, uh, offense, offensiveness is the standard by which you can shut down speech. And that's something that has become universally accepted now, you know, as, as the idea of, if, if something's really super offensive, then that makes it wrong. It makes it bad. It makes it something that be, can be, be suppressed. And, you know, offense is an emotion. It, so basically if this ruffles your feather, if this gets your emotional hackles up, it's okay to suppress something from being said. <coughs> But the second part is the local community standards. And I find that fascinating because, you know, if you look at it in terms of how this played out over the years, what if your local community is a college campus? Well, if your local community is a college campus and you want to ban anything that's offensive by local community standards, you get, you know, you get online, you get sort of campus political correctness, as we used to call it, or wokeness, or, um, uh, the, the cancel culture that we have where, you know, if a speaker comes to say something that, that offends you, that you find offensive, you get to shout him down or get him banned from campus or whatever. But then you also get these laws that are now going on in the books of Florida, where if, you know, if, if any, any single parent or any single person in the community files a complaint about something that's being taught in the schools or about a book that's in the school library, then that thing has to be removed from the school library and, you know, and essentially banned because because somebody in the local community found it offensive. So this idea that of that, that you can you can suppress speech if it's offensive by local community standards, those two things have become the accepted practice on both the left in terms of woke, at least at the radical left in terms of wokeness. And in the on, on the the religious right or the 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 uh, sort of populist right, in terms of you know these 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 uh, the laws being pursued by Ron DeSantis in Florida right now, uh, and and so I think it's interesting how that I, so I'm doing a follow up article on this. I'm going to call it censorship, local express, and round trip. <laughs> It's interesting that you mentioned DeSantis because I've noticed amongst Republicans, Josh Hawley in particular, where their response to the government colluding with tech companies is where they want to suppress right wing speech. The, the right now wants to tell those companies who they have to allow on their platforms, in essence. And that these are private companies. And the answer, if they are indeed colluding with the government, which it seems there's evidence that th th there was some of that going on. So what you then do is you say, stop doing that. You get the government out of those spaces. You don't say, well, if the government can be used for their agenda, let's use the government for our agenda. And that seems to be more of what we're talking about. It's just a complete lack of rational thought where if you identify the principle that the government ought not to be involved in tech spaces and telling them what they can or can't have on their platforms, then you just get the government out. And then if a private company doesn't want you on their platform saying it, well, then that's on them. And if you don't like it, start your own. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing is I, I um, had an interesting discussion with this about someone recently with someone recently uh, that one of the things we don't realize is how this idea of, Hey, let's use the government to support my views and not somebody else's views, you know, and, and to suppress somebody else's views and everybody arguing one way or the other, you know, the, this idea of, uh, uh, you know, tech companies shouldn't be imposing woke dogmas. Instead, we should pass laws that make, a, make them impose our dogmas, yes. right? That, that, uh, that is actually the default position uh, going back in all of history before you had this sort of viewpoint neutral of the idea of free speech that, you know, government should not be getting in to put the thumb on the scales on either side. And the interesting thing is that free speech emerged in part out of the stalemate that came from that 
old that older approach where everyone everyone wanted to use government to impose their usually they impose their religious views right so the the catholics wanted to suppress the protestants and the protestants wanted to suppress the catholics that's that's you know if you go back to european history but that's the long story of it the the catholics want to suppress the protestants and the protestants want to suppress the catholics and free speech emerges uh, our modern concepts of free speech actually kind of emerge out of those battles because what they realize is that we can go hammer and tongs at this for 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 centuries and be killing each other and burning each other at the stake and neither side is actually going to win we're just going to cause a lot of destruction and we basically free speech emerge as a truce realizing that you know this isn't going to work that neither side is going to win by 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 grasping control of the levers of the state and using that to suppress all opposition that it's actually just going to cause a lot of destruction and a lot of constant fighting and free speech emerged as the wait a minute, what if we just leave it up for people to argue and debate? And you know, John Locke is the one who um now he didn't go all the way, by the way. He's still uh, you know, in the context of British politics in 1689, he still uh wanted to have some limits on the civil rights of, of Catholics because they were dangerous and you know, papism and all that. But he actually did lay the foundations of basically saying that look, the only thing that's that's um that's proper to to produce actual real belief and conviction in a person's mind is only as he called it light and evidence. Now, light he meant by you know evidence, argument, I you know ideas, intellectual light, uh, metaphorically speaking. So he said only light and evidence can actually convince a mind. Force can't convince a mind. You can't. Uh, uh, as Jonathan Mayhew, a, a, a Boston preacher in the 18th century who was influential on the founding fathers, said. Uh, uh, you can't dragoon men into being good Christians in the same way you can't dragoon them into being mathematicians. Uh, you, you only only somebody's uh, inner conviction based on based on reasoning and evidence, only their actual belief will turn you into someone who is a a proper believer, an actual believer in the right ideas. And so this idea that you know instead of fighting each other to the standstill uh, and and killing each other for centuries and not achieving anything. We should make this whole thing a matter of free argument and discussion and debate, and that's what we should protect. And you know, the amount of strife and 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 bloodshed that that takes out of society is something I think we don't appreciate because we're the beneficiaries of two hundred years later of people not killing each other yeah. over every religious or political uh, disagreement. The the article that you mentioned, the, the censorship, local and express, I. I think it was that article where Ayn Rand made the point that's very relevant to this discussion, because I think Potter Stewart, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Potter Stewart's the one who said, I don't, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know it when I see it or, or some such thing. Yeah. And they, they went on to decide if it doesn't have any scientific, literary or, or something else value, or something of that sort. But what Rand's concern was, was that the court was taking it upon themselves to be the arbiter of what had those values. And she said, that is not the job of a court. We don't want, you know, politicians or government in general making these decisions, but our two parties are the two main parties that we have. They both love for the government to make decisions. Well, I shouldn't say it. they hate it. Like they hate judicial activism when the other side does it, <laughs> then, it then it's no good. How do we get from where we are to where I think you and I both want to be, and certainly where I, I think Ayn Rand wanted to be, where we have a free society where the government's purpose is just to protect our rights, and we, we don't have this sort of irrational populist driving public policy. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, Ayn Rand, uh, one of the things she she talked about was that she wasn't primarily interested in politics. She had a lot of, you know, very strong political views and arguments for her political position. But beneath that was something even more fundamental. So, you know, she came sort of uh, to prominence, public prominence in 1943 with the publication of her novel, The Fountainhead, which I think is very widely read still today. Um, and she described The Fountainhead as being about individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. And so it's really about the conformist. You know, the person who has collectivism in his soul is the conformist, the person who just wants to be part of a group, just wants to fit in, just wants to mold his views to to fit a, a social group. Whereas the individual is the person who just only want, who's looking at reality. You know, he's looking at reality firsthand. He's basing his views on what he thinks is true and doesn't care what group he's he's fitting in with or dissenting from, et cetera. 
And I think that is one of the major drivers of this. Cause I talk about how group identity has this impact. Um, I think that what, what causes people to want to say, Oh, I, you know, my group should control what can be said. And, you know, uh, we should be the ones to, to know it when we see it, <laughs> when it comes to something that's offensive, it, it comes from this idea. The group is supreme that, that, you know, and, and you'll see this as an ideological, you know, explicit ideological driver in both <clears throat> the, the left, the woke left and the nationalist, right. The nationalist right says, you know the real good that we're after is not the good of the uh, of the autonomous individual. They speak scornfully of scornfully of the autonomous individual. It's society as a whole, and it's it's the the right of society as a whole to dictate the course of what's good for the social environment in general. That's why we have to suppress all this individualism, and including the individualism of having individual thinking. You know, we should be bound to tradition and traditional values rather than thinking for ourselves. Uh, this is the sort of the Surab Amari uh, hardcore nationalist position. Whereas on the left, you have this idea that, well, look, all knowledge is socially constructed. All knowledge, all values, everything is socially constructed. Uh, and the only reason why you think, you know, a man in a dress isn't a woman is because of the words you've been taught to use and the, the social and how you've been socialized. And therefore, if we want to have a, a society that will be tolerant to the people we like, we have to then control what words you use and what ideas you encounter. And you know, if if all of if, if, if reality is all socially constructed, we can reconstruct it by recon, you know, by by pay, taking over the levers of society and putting, making sure that the right words and ideas and concepts get into your head, and making sure the wrong ideas and concepts and facts are not allowed to get into your head. And so it's it it comes from this this um, fundamentally from this anti-individualism this 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 belief that everything is really about society and the need for society as a whole to have control and for the good of society to take precedence over the good of the individual which always ends up meaning and this was Ayn Rand's big warning it always ends up meaning society takes precedence over the mind of the individual it takes precedent over your ability to 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 look directly at the facts and and see what's true out in reality and of course, it's a great way for a whole society to, to run over a cliff. I mean, the, the example I would point to right now, because it's it's in the headlines, is uh, what's happening in Russia with Vladimir Putin. You know, that he he invaded Ukraine because he had a political system where nobody could tell him he was wrong. You know, no, if, if he had this, this some idea, that, oh, Ukraine's not a real country. They won't fight us. We'll go in and you know, three, the, 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 the war will be three days and we'll knock over the government and we'll take over. And he had, this, he had this, this situation where nobody in the entire society could challenge his ideas or tell him he's wrong uh, without, you know, risk of persecution. And of course, what he does then is he, you know, he takes this whole country and drives it over a cliff and, you know, results of tens of thousands of dead, a crashed economy, a brain drain of all the all the talented people in this country trying to get out as as however they can and go wherever they can. So you have these situations where when you put society over the judgment of the individual, over the facts, over reason, you have a whole society can like lemmings all at once go over a cliff. And and that's that basically is is the the thing that we're warning against. And uh, you know, I think we have a very strong system that you know that the that free speech is actually very strong. It's stronger in some ways than it has ever been. Um, I think we have these very big threats rising up against it, but I think we have the reserves in the culture of these values and institutions and and, and the constitution on our side to be able to protect that and and keep us from having that 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 healthy degree of argument and self-criticism that keeps us from going over a cliff. All right. Before I let you go, this show is called the rational egoist and I could not let you out of here without telling us about this upcoming work. You've got the, I think it's the pocket guide to selfishness. Am I correct? Is that the, that the that, title? That is, that is correct. Yeah, so pocket please, guide to selfishness. please something, tell us about this. It, it's something I'm working on for the Atlas society. They have a series of pocket guides and this is one that uh, I, I remarked that I really like because you know, selfishness or self-interest. This is the most sort of, in a way, the most controversial and radical part of Ayn Rand's philosophy is that she argued not just, she, she argued in favor of, you know, if you want to put it in technical terms, rational self-interest, but she actually went 
the farther than that and, and putting it more dramatically, she wrote about the virtue of selfishness. Because this idea is, you know, people ask, why does she use the word selfishness? And she said, for the reason that makes you afraid of it. Because she she thought it was so deeply embedded into the culture, this idea that self-interest is horribly evil and, and wrong and everything having to do with self and self and the self and self-interest is is the essence of evil that she wanted to just ta- challenge that by going as far uh, in the other direction by, by by stating it as boldly in the other direction and you know i found that that one of the things i'm i'm t- writing about here is that the way in which language has been distorted on this and that that this presumption against self-interest has distorted the way people talk about it so i wrote a piece a couple of years ago about how um There are people arguing that, oh, people who don't get vaccinations uh, against COVID are being selfish, but not getting a vaccination, you're being selfish. I'm like, well, why does that make sense? These are people who actually believe that the vaccines work. You know, they they were basically arguing that vaccines work. The vaccines will protect uh, you from getting it. They'll protect you from spreading it to somebody else. But then they're saying you're selfish for not getting the vaccine. Well, Well, if the vaccine works, and I think it does work then why would it be in your self-interest not to get it, not yeah. to be protected against a, a deadly disease? And it struck me that what selfishness means in a lot of people's minds is, I think something is bad. And if I want to make it sound really, really, really bad, I'll use the worst description I can come up with it for it, which is that it's selfish. And I thought, well, you know, the problem with that and the problem with using self, abusing the word selfish in that way is if you tell people that do that such that you know not if there's something you really want people to do and you tell them not doing that is selfish, they might actually believe you. They might believe that yes, this isn't my self-interest, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It's like the most counterproductive way to argue for something. But one of the things I'm trying to do in in this pocket guide is sort of sweep away uh that that sort of the way that's been encrusted by years and years of people misusing these terms. It's actually, fa- the history of this is actually fascinating, which is that um, a philosophy of self-interest is actually not that radical historically. If you go back to Aristotle or Plato, to the earliest in Greek philosophers, you know, Aristotle said, well, the greatest good is happiness and, you know, you should be pursuing happiness. And that tradition goes all the way through to, you know, so the, the philosopher, John Locke, English philosopher, John Locke, uh, who I talked about being at, you know, at the root of a lot of our modern arguments for free speech. He was also hugely influential on the founding fathers in America. And he is the one who actually, I believe, was the first to use the term pursuit of happiness in writing about ethics, that you know, the, the goal of ethics is the pursuit of happiness. So this idea that you know the individual should be out pursuing his own happiness is a staple of, of, of moral philosophy for 2,000 years. And it's only in you know the term altruism. Uh, if you go to its roots, it was actually coined in 1830 uh, by a French philosopher named Auguste Comte. And this idea that you should not pursue your own self-interest, that that the only thing that's moral is to sacrifice for the sake of others, that radical pro self sacrifice view really dates to the early 19th century. But it, it what happened is it sort of came, it took over, it became all the vogue, and there were actually. Uh, there was a vogue for altruism as a word in America around the, the late 19th century. And that's where you get this presumption that, you know, sa- sacrificing for the sake of others is mor- is is the only thing that's moral and self-interest is totally immoral. Uh, but actually, if you go back to it, in, in, you know, historically trying to come up with some idea of rational self-interest or enlightened self-interest or self-interest properly understood, all these terms, these are phrases that were used was actually the mainstream of of moral thinking and it makes sense if you look at it from if you sweep away all the all these you know historical uh uh circumstances and all the all the things we've sort of been taught we're supposed to think and you look at it from the perspective of you know where would you start in life well you know here we are we're living beings trying to uh survive and and thrive and and uh and and to make the most of what is available to us in the world right we are and and that if you look at it that is pursuing our self-interest being selfish uh and the purpose of life is to figure out how can we all do that now you know and i get into this in in the pocket guide you know it is rational self-interest that i'm rational selfishness that i'm advocating and rational selfishness means you realize that the, you are, you're going to be a lot better off uh, pursuing your interests in cooperation with other people. And in a free society where everybody has equal rights, you're going to be a lot better off than, you know, in in uh, 
uh, a war of all against all. Uh, 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 the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes talked about the, you know, the war of all against all, in which in life in which life is nasty, solitary, brutish, and short. Uh, and that is actually true. That if you have you know a, a, a constant warfare with other people or constant conflict with other people. We are not going to be able to build a modern advanced society in which we're all going to be better off. But the whole point of that is to figure out how can we all be selfish together, right? How could we have a system in which everyone is able to pursue their self-interest with rules that will, you know, you, you have rights and you have to respect the rights of others so that we could all you know, rise up together. And we have, you know, hundreds of years of a spectacular example of, of that. If you look at you know, wealth, especially in Western uh, countries that, that were first experienced the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, this tremendous increase of wealth for everyone, that the average person is way better off than, you know, is better off in some respects than than kings and emperors were two or 300 years ago. We have a situation in which we've all worked together pursuing our self-interest in, uh, in a free society that allows us to, to all rise up together. And the, the job of ethics should be to figure out how do we do that? You know, what are the rules we need to follow? How do we go about doing that? Uh, what does rational or enlightened self, self-interest self mean? What really is selfish? Rather than trying to say, deny that and say, no, 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 we should all be living like monks and 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 sacrifice and, and engage in, in, in permanent self-sacrifice. I think we have this um this odd conundrum where most people actually live according to you know, rational self-interest or enlightened self-interest, but at the same time, in our language, we refuse to to affirm that and to say yes, that is our that is the code we live on. Let's let's affirm that. Let's define it. Let's talk about what it means. And instead, we 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 sort of we we keep denouncing it as evil as 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 a bad thing, the thing that we're all doing, <laughs> and it is this weird uh, sort of cultural this this guilt that we've built up over the years that that keeps us from acknowledging how it is we actually live. Yeah, I, I think that probably leads to a lot of unearned guilt and widespread inferiority complexes. When you believe one thing is right and, and behave the other way, the, the result can't be good. I well, also think it, it it's a driver of the, some of the things we've been talking about, the, the vitriol of our debate that um, – you know, we all I think most people live according to light and self-interest, but they have to come up with a cause, you know, altruistic cause that they're going to fight for. And so they become a warrior for one cause or a warrior for the other cause. And they substitute going online, going online to argue with other people as a warrior for your cause is almost like a way to make yourself feel good, even though you're pursuing self-interest that they make you feel moral, even though you're actually pursuing your self-interest in, in the other 90 percent of your life. All right, Rob. So where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at, oh, well, the main place to go is trzinskyletter.substack.com. That's my own newsletter. And from there, you'll find things that I do um, on, uh, I have a column for Discourse. I do things for the Atlas Society. You, you'll find all the various other places I'm getting published. And you have a book too, right? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. So who is John Galt anyway? A Reader's Guide to Atlas Shrugged, which you can find at Amazon. All right. Just search for John Galt anyway. Thank you very much for being here. And if you're watching, please rate us, leave your comments, even if they're bad. Now, while, while I, of course, would prefer that you like, share, and subscribe, I want to hear the bad stuff too. For now, this is The Rational Egoist. Join us next time. Thank you for being here.